this continues our discussion. This is a slide we left off on last week. And what we've got here is you've got your uh, IDMC, your cylinder identification signal is sent to the uh, injector driver module, you know, which has got some step-up transformers. It brings the 12 volts up to 115 and shoots the injectors. Why is it that the injectors get 115? What's the importance of that? Why do they want that much voltage going to the injectors? Two ohms, 115 volts. What do you get when you get that? You get fast. You get quick. You get instantaneous, right? Uh, what does the injector? What does the injector on like one of these Plano Chevrolet pickups have for his resistance? Got any idea? 16 ohms, roughly 14 to 16 ohms. Unless it's something. If you if you can see a vehicle that's higher uh, um, power, like a turbocharged or something like that, it's going to be really strong. That's usually going to have injectors with fewer ohms because less ohms means quicker, you know, snapping or quicker. The, the color coding on some injectors tells you how many pounds of fuel per hour it can deliver. Like these injectors right over here on this board, or gray, that's 14 pounds per hour. If you see orange ones, that would be 19 pounds per hour. Because engineers measure fuel in weight, pound per hour. And aircraft do it that way too. They don't tell them how many gallons of fuel they put in. They put how many tons of fuel they put in a jet. You know, so that's interesting too how that goes. The camshaft position sensor signal is used by the PCM to generate the cylinder identification and the fuel delivery control signals. Okay, so this is basically what you're looking at right here. Camshaft position sensor. This right here is your crank gear. That's your cam gear. And notice you have this right here. You've got your number one TDC and your number four TDC. The cam position sen sensor can basically if the, if the thrust bearings in that camshaft wear out so that it's walking, it can screw that signal up too. A lot of people don't know that. There is a way that you can check that to see how much slop it's got. Uh, but that's in, a, that's in another presentation that I give on that. But that little sensor right there, you're basically down under the truck and you reach up very fairly easy. You pull the little bolt out and you jerk it out of there. And it's kind of reminiscent of the ones in some of these uh, Chevrolets with the uh, spider fuel injection on it. And, uh, Cam's in the block on that one? Uh, yeah, yeah, cam's in the block on that one. It doesn't have over here cam on that one. Now this is the 7.3. Once again, this is the 7.3. This is what we're starting on right here. This was the first electronic diesels that got pretty widespread, you know, and it came out in 94, lasted until 03, and then they replaced it with a 6 liter, and then they went on up to the, uh, you know, common rail and all that. But the position of cylinder number one is indicated by a narrow vein on the trigger wheel, and number four cylinder, which is the fifth in the fire order, is indicated by a wide vein on the trigger wheel. You see those right there? That's not too terribly complicated to uh, recognize, but you've got a narrow vein and a wide vein. Knowing what goes on in there is going to you know, kind of set you apart a little bit if you can. And that's a, see a wide vein and a narrow vein. That's where you're telling you what. Now look at these fire orders. I thought this was really interesting. I put this together this morning. When I first went to school on this uh, 7.3, and they told me what the fire order was, and I numbered the cylinders, what I found out was the fire order pattern is the same as an old 7.5 liter gas burner. So to see the how the cylinders are numbered on a power scope is 1357-2468. Now it's numbered kind of like a Dodge and a Chevy, but you might notice that number one is on this side instead of that side. See that? So you got odd right there. And so the fire order on this is 1, 2, 7, 3, 4, 6, 5, 6, 8. And it's not that you're going to cross any spark plug wires or anything, but if you're finding TDC, you know, you're going to need to know where that, what, what order they come up in. Okay, well look at the pattern. I drew the pattern here. 1, 4, 2, you know, 6. 1, 5, 4, 2, 6, 3, 7, 8. 2, 3, 1, 5, 4, 2, 6, 3, 7, 8. Anyway, when I drew that 1, 5, 4, 2, 6, 3, 7, 8. See, when I drew that pattern, and I did that at school up there in 1994. I says, look at this. One, it's the same thing as the 302, or you know, that old 302. Now, I was, it's kind of funny yesterday, the thing wasn't here, but I, yeah. he pulled this, he pulled this uh, van in here, and he said, well, I got to pull those plug, plug, plug wires out and get the fuel filter. And he kept, he didn't, it took a real man to tighten the fuel filter up on the carburetor so it wouldn't leak, I and mean, he tightened it several times and it kept squirting. So I just got in there with just one hand and <clears throat> tightened it up so it wouldn't leak. You know, that's what it was. But uh, made it feel bad. But don't worry, I look at him shaking his head over. But uh, then he put it back on. I says, the fire, I was thinking this is a 302 because that's what most of the vans had in them. He, I said, one, five, four, two, six, three, seven, eight. So we crank it up and it's really kind of ragged. It's missing on four of the cylinders. And I'm pulling the plug wires off. I said, wait a minute. This has got to be, what, I'm looking at this sticker. Oh, that's in the 5.8. This is one, three, seven, two, six, five, four, eight. So when he put them in there, it just hummed. But I think it was running crappy when he pulled it in with the wrong fire order when you pulled it in. She said, remember she was saying that it ran bad. And even after you had it running 
crappy with the wrong fiber, she said it run better than it was. You know, so that's pretty yeah, cool. like that's four sixty. Yeah. But anyway, that's just funny to me. Accelerator pedal position sensor on this diesel. Uh, it's got does not use mechanical linkage or cable from the accelerator pedal to control engine speed. It's drive by wire, electronic signals from the accelerator pedal sensor to the PCM. And basically you've got uh, an idle and it doesn't show it on the schematic, but there's an out of idle validation switch and it has to agree with the TP sensor if it doesn't or with the accelerator pedal sensor. If it doesn't agree with it, it won't do anything but idle. And I've had to change the accelerator pedal assembly on several of these. You don't just play the sensor, you change the whole thing, but it ain't hard to do. Basically, you unplug the wires, take three bolts out, pop the new pedal in there, you know, plug the wires back in, you're good to go. Got your exhaust back pressure regulator that's basically measuring exhaust back pressure so it'll know what it needs to do with that uh, flap back there on the, under the turbo. PCM uses the uh, idle validation signal to verify when the accelerator pedal is in idle with, with the switch open or off idle, which means the switch is closed. So it works, acts kind of like a door jam switch. It closes the switch whenever you get off idle, right? And yeah, that's something we did for years to detect the in-range failure of a uh, accelerator pedal sensor. If it disagrees, it'll just idle. You know, like I say, it's not too uncommon to see. Engine oil temperature sensor is a thermistor. And it's mounted to the oil, how oil pressure is work. There it is right there. The glow plug relay, intake air heater relay. Incidentally, both the power stroke and the Duramax have intake air heaters on them, but they operate in a different way. This one here, as I remember, only operates early on as you need it for the first 90 seconds, but the Duramax will turn the heater on any time you need it. And the heater looks, the heater, the heater will both look real similar. I got a picture in here somewhere, I believe. But uh, these are the things that, uh, this has to do with these outputs. That's what this is all about. See, so your engine oil temperature is gonna affect the output of the glow plug relay, intake air relay, the uh, exhaust back pressure regulator, glow plug lamp, uh, and injector control pressure regulator, and your injector. Now this right here determines in other words, the PCM operates this to change the pressure that's delivered to these. So the higher this pressure is, the more fuel it's going to deliver, right? Okay, an exhaust back pressure regulator. Cool thing about that is, you know, if you've got two sensors that are both reading pressure, you know, like your, and the EVP uh, exhaust back pressure got a little pipe coming up to it. Sometimes a little pipe will stop up with carbon and throw codes on there. And you'd have to try to either replace that pipe or clean it up. A little bitty pipe, it ain't very big. Uh, information provided by the manifold air temperature is used by the PCM to calculate air density. So basically, there's your map, and this that's the only output that has anything to do with this. It's pretty important to understand that when you're trying to figure out what's going on. I don't know how many of them that can like I've replaced. You know, just bunches and bunches of them. Every, you know, they come in for a no start, and it's like that a little bit aggravating because it's right down in there. But once you got once you've done a few of them, you know, it takes an inch and an eighth wrench to screw it out of there. And I actually we had to want to do it one in a van here one time, and I cut the wrench and got down there where you bring it out of there. Uh, but you got to take some stuff out of the way to get to it. Um, anyway, your manifold absolute pressure sensor is right there. The map sensor is going to be watching for that. And that is used to control fuel quality and, or excuse me, quantity, not quality, injector timing. The map sensor is controlled for turbocharger boost pressure. So we can actually see that. Digital map sensor, analog map sensor. This one here reads voltage, that one there reads frequency, okay? So the map sensor signal also controls smoke from the exhaust by limiting fuel quantity during the operation until a specific boost pressure is obtained. So remember, this is a turbocharged engine. Your injection control pressure system is closed loop. What is a closed loop system? Somebody tell me right now. It's constantly It's feedback. It has. It has something. What is your? What do you have a closed loop system in your uh, on the inside of your car? It's not closed loop. Yeah. What else? Oh, Unless you got automatic temperature control. Did you have the um, the AC system? What about what about your radio? Is it closed loop? What do you mean? Yeah. When you turn your radio up and it's too loud, your ears tell you you need to turn it down. So you turn it down. That's a closed loop. I mean, I'm trying to get you to understand what a closed loop system is instead of just hearing the words and your eyes glaze over and say, I don't really care. But if a closed loop system has basically got a feedback so it can make adjustments. Now see, the output is your hand turning the knob. The input is your ear. And so your brain is supposed to decide, I don't like that noise. I don't like the station it's on. I'm going to change the station or whatever. You got me? Right, so that's basically what you got your injector control pressure regulator. This is sort of laid out. This, these channels here are built into the heads on this particular one. Now on the six liter, the, the oil rail is actually removable. On this one here, it's a part of the head. 
in your injection control switch or sensor over here, what they don't show you, in this particular head over here, there's a little plug that looks that, that where this could go, and you can actually take that little plug out over there. If you take that out and you take that plug out when you've been working on this, like when you're changing out an injector on it, you're supposed to drain the fuel rail and the oil rail. Let all that out of there. And there's some little plugs you drain that in the back of the head, you know, there's some fuel rail plugs. Because if you pull the injector out without draining those rails, where does all that fuel and oil go? Blah, 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 down into the cylinder. So you've got it full of fluid. And if you're dumb enough to where you don't realize that went down in there and you go to try to spin it over, bam, you've been a rod and locked it all up, it's a bad scene. You gotta recognize the fact. Now what I had done is let it just gurgle down in there and then I'd bump the engine over real slowly and let it blow it back out of there. You know? <laughs> I've done that before. You know, but you gotta make sure that you kill your fuel pump and you get rid of, you know. Well, one way or another, after these are empty, when you've changed an injector or something, what you're gonna need to do is take this one out, take that one out, and I get out there, I get to watching them, I spin the engine over, and then I see that oil come up into those rails. Because this thing right here puts out a heck of a lot of pressure, but it don't put out that much volume. And then it makes sure, that, and see the engine's kind of in there to tilt anyway. So as it fills them up, and when it runs out there, you put those back in. But if somebody just puts it all back together, and they don't bleed the air out of those oil rails, it's going to spin, 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 spin. And there's one guy, that we take the top off of the fuel filter back there, and he's changing the fuel filter on everything, he pours it full of seafoam. And what that does is, he, you know, that cleans the injectors and all that kind of stuff, he said. You know, it does a good job, supposedly. But it carries out the test of controlling the high-pressure oil of the injectors. And I've got high-pressure oil on all these things painted purple. That was my choice there. Now the sensor measures the pressure, that's your feedback, but then the high pressure roller, as it controls it here, it measures it there. And then like what it sees, you know, it changes that. Now that never goes over about 65% duty cycle. Uh, now on your, uh, and it was interesting to me, on the common rail systems, like on the, uh, the Duramax, uh, basically the, if, you, if you disconnect this one on the power stroke, the pressure goes away and the truck won't start. If you disconnect the, the fuel rail control pressure on a Duramax, it tops out. In other words, it defaults to the highest pressure, which is 23,550 pounds, or something like that. Now, the common rail fuel pressure is higher than the common than this oil pressure in here, because this oil rail pressure never goes over about 3,700 pounds. All right, the, it's a variable force solenoid and the high pressure oil pump. The more current you put to it, the more it moves. You got it, it stops it up. If you unplug it, you still get a no start there, right? Like I said, the solenoid is used to control high oil pressure delivered to the injectors. High oil pressure is regulated by the redirected oil to the sump instead of delivered. If you unplug the sensor, the system defaults to 725 psi, so it'll start up. Like if you've got a bad ICP sensor and it won't start, and you disconnect that, it'll default to 725. And if it starts, you'll know that that sensor is probably all that's wrong with it. If it does still doesn't start, you probably have low control oil pressure. See what I'm saying? So that's really important stuff. Zero to 65 percent duty cycle. There's your injectors, and the percentage is increased. The amount of injector control pressure is also increased. As that goes up, the pressure, the oil rail pressure delivered to the injectors goes up. And so it's a variable capacitance sensor threaded into the left cylinder head up in the front of it, uh, which is right there where the oil rail is. That oil rail is, you know, actually machined into there. Produces an analog signal proportional to the pressure in the left hand high pressure oil rail. It doesn't know what the pressure in the right hand one is. I mean, it's not measuring that one. And there's a procedure that you go to if you think injectors are dumping all of the oil pressure out of one head, you can cap it off and see if it'll start on the other head. <laughs> and this kind of thing. So there's, there's stuff you do to make that happen. Here's your wastegate control system. Here's your wastegate control actuator. What's the wastegate for? Does, do all of these have a wastegate? Just one with the charge air cooler, which would be your intercooler. Because when you squeeze air, it gets hot. If you cool it down, it's going to do better, right? That's why people have these cold air intakes on there, you know, because they feel like, you know, you're driving in the rain, and your vehicle seems to have more power. You ever notice that? So that's, what, that's the idea of how to cool air intake, you know. Uh, we've got to bleed to the air inlet here, wastegate control cell. Now, what happens if you unplug this? It defaults to no boost. And I got it where it basically, it, you can't unplug this and get max boost. Look, because a lot of people are going to do that. You know, they're going to see this way they can get away with it. And all that. So there's your charge air cooler out there right there. All right, now there's your wastegate control solenoid. That's what it looks like in the real world. Okay, so when boost pressure is too high, which is greater than 15 psi, the PCM sends a low percentage duty cycle 
to the wastegate solenoid to open the wastegate and reduce boost pressure. Like I said, you disconnect it, your boost is going away. All right, so you're, but he's looking at map. See, there's your input, and that's basically operating electrics where you remember your PCM is going through your ice. Uh, DM to operate the injector from a lot of voltage. The IDM is a bigger box than the PCM. They draw it smaller, but it's a bigger box. It's thicker and slightly bigger than that one. All right, the PCM reads the EOT and the barrow sends the signals to determine glow flow at home time. It energizes the relay up to 120 seconds, up to two minutes. It can burn a glow plug. Um, and all that. So how did I tell you you can determine when you've got one bad glow plug? You remember that from last week? Amperage. How many amps does these go plug pull? A lot. 25 amps. 25 amps when you first fire it up, it drops back to 15 as it heats up. Because as it gets hot, it's got more resistance. All right, so I've got eight glow plugs, and I put my inductive amp lead around the, where it's going out of that glow plug relay down the glow plug. If you see two of these relays side by side, one of them's for the charge air cooler, I mean, not the charge air cooler, but the uh, uh, intake heater, and the other one is for the glow plug. But if I'm going to go around the one for the glow plugs here, I'm going to measure that with my inductive meter. I can, you can use your charging system tester and just look at those numbers over there. I fire that thing up, you know, turn it on, just let it burn. If I see it goes to 200 amps and drops back to 125, I'm good to go, right? At least on my glow plug part of it. I don't know anything else, but if I get on there, like if I got one that starts up and it's skipping, and it's a non-California truck that's not looking at glow plugs and, you know, watching them all the time, uh, then I'll say, well, well, if it starts and it's skipping and then it cleans up its axis and warms up, and we don't have a bunch of back pressure or something coming out of the, you know, uh, intake, I mean, of the uh, crankcase. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to hook that thing up, and if it goes up to 175 and drops back to 110 amps, I know i got one glow plug right now. I don't know which one it is. Hook my test light to hot, touch each one of them separately with the wires unplugged, and I can find out which one's bad. Then you pull the valve cover off on this one, and you change them out. Now on the 6 liter, you can change, it, change them out without pulling the valve cover off. It's a different deal. Um, all right. It also reads battery voltage to protect the glow plug from being damaged if it's up high. Uh, that illumination time is independent of glow plug. If your your glow plugs may still be burning even though the glow plug light has gone off, because there's an after glow after glow thing that you got on there. So I was thinking about the GM fans after blow. You know, sometimes when you shut the car off, they keep they keep blowing to dry the evaporator. But anyway, the glow plugs may continue to be energized after the vehicle started to reduce white smoke. If you, any fuel is not burning coming out of the back, like, well, think about this, on a gas burner, you know, you, you typically are going to see black smoke if you're overfueling a little bit. Now you, you can overfuel a diesel and get black smoke, but if it's cold, you know, and it's, you know, the engine's not warm yet, you'll make white smoke a lot of fuel coming out of there. All right, so the glow plugs are self-limiting, which presents overheating. As a result, they don't require cycling on and off. They don't have to kick them on and off like the older ones used to do. I worked on an 83 model, uh, 73 one time it was a diesel and it would burn up glow plugs. I mean just repeatedly burning up glow plugs. And I had a little controller back there, it was like a glorified turn signal flasher, it had six pins on it. And basically what it was supposed to do was cycle the glow plugs. Uh, but what was the problem was with that one, I finally found out after it burned up several sets of glow plugs, was that wire harness that plugged into that uh, controller back there, the, the, uh, those round uh, uh, females were spread out where they went down onto that thing and they wouldn't make good contact. And so that's why I kept burning up glow plugs. It took me a little while to figure that one out. It's an 83 model, an old one, if I remember right. Uh, when, uh, so it will cycle on and off repeatedly only with system voltage greater than 14 and a half. Now that's one of the reasons that one of the alternators is taken offline when the glow plugs are burning, when you got two alternators. You don't always have two alternators, but you know what I'm saying? All right, that's what they look like on the, on the truck right there. You know, one of these is for the glow plug, and the other one is for the, uh, the heater. Now that, uh, that intake heater burns about 50 amps, so that's all it does on that. There's your glow plug sensor circuit. That's a glow plug monitor when you got the California thing going on. There's a shunt there, and you got a glow plug relay, and it's basically measuring those. That's only used on 97 and newer California vehicles with a gross combined vehicle weight of less than 14,500 pounds. So you got to memorize that. That's going to be on the pop test. Okay. Uh, it only checks glow plug operation when all temperature or altitude conditions cause the glow plugs to stay on for 30 seconds or more and system voltages between 11, 8, and 14. All right. Exhaust back pressure control is right here. Look at all the stuff it's looking at. Engine oil temperature sensor, cam sensor, intake air temperature sensor, exhaust back pressure sensor. And this is the stuff, these are your outputs. You know, well, that's actually an input there, and that is. But this one here is your output, I'm sorry. That's your regulator right there. The regulator basically is what operates that little oil piston that opens and closes that flapper. So when it's in, when you when your cabin heat 
And when you bring your cabin heat up, it closes it off so that it creates an exhaust restriction so a warm up or a diesel won't warm up all that quick. Uh, heat up temperature and air temperature sensors are used to determine the need for exhaust back pressure. So they don't operate all the time. If it ever sticks closed, it'll rob you of a bunch of your power. And the guy called me one time about that. And I said, look back there and see if that thing moves. And he goes, no, it's in this position all the time. I said, well, it's stuck closed. You got to put one of those on there. You know? So the PCM uses the AP, IBS, and six cam position sensor to determine engine load and speed. And the system can only activate your low load, low RPM operation. Whenever you're really getting on it, you got high load, it's going to open it up so you get most of your power, right? And it uses intake air temperature sensor information to determine whether it enables exhaust back pressure control or PCM strategies that compensate for cold ambient temperature. All right, and there's your EVP sensor and your regulator. See, the regulator is like a solenoid, like an oil solenoid. That's it, oil going in there that piston. And I think I'm somewhere on here, I probably got a video of that. If I'm, uh, This is the shorter version of that thing. Uh, that is a symbol for a thermistor right there, by the way. Uh, or I mean for a pressure transistor. The PCM uses a relay to control the operation of the electric fuel pump. The PCM monitors voltage to the electric fuel pump through the fuel pump monitor circuit. And what that means is whenever it's watching the output from the relay, when it turns on the relay, it looks for that relay to get hot on the leg coming out. When it turns off the relay, what should it see on the leg leading to the fuel pump? The output from the fuel pump, from between the fuel pump relay and the fuel pump, what's it supposed to see when the fuel pump is not energized? Uh, it's supposed to see uh, ground. It's supposed yeah. to see ground coming back through the pump. That's what I'm always telling you guys. If you've got one that doesn't got no fuel pressure, hook it to hot, go into that prime terminal if it's a GM or whatever, go into the fuel pump relay output terminal so you see a ground there. If you don't see a ground there, you got an open circuit between the pump, between the relay and the pump. If you kick the gas tank and that light comes on, you say, well, i got to put a pump in it. And then do it. See what I'm saying? It won't always be the pump, though. Sometimes it will be an inertia switch, a bad connection between there, but usually the pump comes on with it because that's the, part, that's the component that's working the hardest and is actually doing the most, you know, it's in the most hostile environment. That's usually what fails. All right, so you got your electronic fuel supply here. Now, there's your water and fuel indicator lamp. You've got a fuel pump relay right there on that. And only 97 up. When you switch on, the ones that have the electric fuel pump, now, some of them have got a, you know, the earlier ones had the first generation had a mechanical fuel pump. But the ones that's got an electric fuel pump, how long does the fuel pump run on one of these diesels when you first switch your key on? You remember? 20 seconds. 20 seconds. You remember that. That's good. All right. Now, this, like I say, this is all 7.3 stuff. The first generation and second generation work slightly different. They were still 7.3. There's your fuel pump reset indicator lamp. You've got an inertia switch right there. What's a fuel pump reset indicator lamp for? That's so you'll know when the inertia switch is tripped. Duh. Some of them have it, some of them don't. You know? All right. So if the monitor circuit between the inertia switch and the fuel pump. See how it's monitoring that? It's watching that lead. It's watching that right there. See, this right here delivers power that goes to the fuel pump. Now, this power is not going here, but the PCM is reading it. That's why I say on the other side of this, where the word fuel pump is right here, there's a ground there. All right, and basically these circuits are monitored to detect circuit malfunctions, including intermittent failures. And there's your water and fuel indicator lamp. This is a complicated circuit. You got a fuse, you got a light, you got your little, you know, thing there. All right, engine, uh, key on engine off, the PCM energizes the fuel pump relay for 20 seconds to prime the system. And you, if you, what happens if ordinarily if you run a diesel out of fuel? It takes a long time to take it back up. Not on these. Be surprised. You run the thing out of fuel, pour some more fuel in there, it fires right up. Because that thing primes up. It's got little bleeders in that fuel head, in that fuel filter head, that pushes all the air out, you know, kind of like the little bleeders in your thermostat. Remember those? It pushes all that air out of there so that your fuel system is, you know, purged of air and all that. I remember when I was there teaching this thing in Fort Worth, you know, I was talking about return of the fuel systems. One of the mechanics said, well, where does the, where does the air go if it doesn't return, you know, on that particular system the way you got it drawn there? You know, I think Kevin Panic called me, you know, I, said, I don't know. I mean, it, it gets out of there. I mean, it pushes through the injectors, what it does, you know. But what people want you to hear, want to hear you say when you don't know is, I don't know. They don't want you to tell them just something, anything. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you're supposed to be teaching them. All right, 30 to 80 PSI is how much your fuel is supposed to be going to the, is, is being delivered to the injectors. Uh, if an engine RPM signal is not detected within 20 seconds, the fuel pump relay is de-energized until it gets an RPM signal. And that's the little strategy thing there. Water and fuel sensor, cam sensor. There's your fuel pump. That's the little way the circuit's going to operate right there. 
there's no throttle plate, there's no cable on this particular one, but the speed control is accomplished by the ring fuel timing. Now on some of the diesels you will see throttle plates, but the only reason those are there is so that it can cause a low pressure and an EGR will flow. And then they came up with a different way to do that, and no problem. Vehicle speed sensor for your speed control. Transmission range sensor, it needs to know what that's in. That transmission range sensor can cause crazy problems on one of these too, you know, like that. Uh, the boost switch, that's brake on off switch, that's when you hit the brake, you know, guys, yeah. Speed control, clutch switch, brake pressure applied switch, park brake. Do you want the cruise control to keep trying to cruise when you're mashing the clutch? You don't. Because if you do, it's probably going to try to run away, you know, like Alright, so here you go. There's your, your basically, you got a cruise indicator lamp put out on that too. Vehicle speed signal is produced by a variable reluctant sensor, which is one of those, like, what's on the front of this motor right here. It, can, it makes a little, you know, wave thing, you know, this little laser right here is about to die. Makes one of these, you know. We have part of a variety of systems that can be located in different areas. It can get a vehicle speed signal from a lot of places, you know, basically from the ABS system or the rear end or whatever, you know. And there's your feed control switches, uses brake pressure. Oh, I had one one time the cruise control wouldn't work on and the reason it wouldn't work is because the park brake was one click down. And it seems to me like I remember right on that one, the, the park brake line didn't work, but the park brake was one click down. When I went in there with a scan tool, I saw that it saw park brake activation. And with park brake activated, cruise won't work, even if it ain't slowing the truck down, right? Uh, so your brake pressure applied switch, that's that little switch that's screwed down there into the into the uh, into the master cylinder, and sometimes those right there, and there are all kinds of cars that have crews. Fluid will put be pushed through that because you know you've got only lots and lots of pressure here. Fluid, if it's failed, fluid can come through there and go into the wire harness and go into the you know various different connectors and all. I told you all about one of those in my transmission class where one of these filled up a connector down there and it was causing issues because it was you know the brake fluid's conducted, right? Clutch pedal position switch, brake uh, part brake applied, so on and so forth. It'll deactivate speed control as the parking brake supply. That's what I talked about earlier. All right. Transmission range sensor. Now, what do you see here? Is this transmission range sensor digital or analog? Can you look at it and tell? Got to be analog, doesn't it? Good answer, thing. Okay. Uh, well, it does. I'm serious. I mean, that's a. You got to know what the what the deal is on that. Um, so, the digital sensor and the analog sensor are different. See that one down there? Got a lot of different outputs. That one out there, what happens on that one? What happens on that one there? If I was measuring that voltage right there, this laser is going to have to be done away. I've had this laser for 20 years. I guess. But anyway, it's what's going to happen to that voltage right there? Huh? Yeah, I know. What's happening to the voltage? <laughs> on that top one. I'm measuring that voltage right there. I'm putting it through the gears. What are you going to see on your scope? You got your scope set on one second per division. What are you going to see? They look like stair steps. Oh, 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 oh. Then you go back the other way. If you see any scratchiness in it, you better put one of those on there. The digital one is basically they got four switches in it, and they vary, they close at various different times, and those like ones and zeros, right? Okay, this is where we're going to stop today. Uh, you guys, look, you guys picking up on this? You gonna be able to fix the power stroke if one comes in, darkens your door? I have to watch the video over again. Right. Um, sure. Yeah, I'm gonna the computer out there.